If you do need any sermon notes, they are still in the back, if that helps you. And we are back in the book of Ruth, and we have much to cover tonight. So open your Bibles to Ruth chapter 3, and buckle up, because... Are you buckled? Good. You guys are so responsive. Good. Let's do it. In our study of the book of Ruth... We have been looking at the uh, providence of God. God's providence is God's governance of His creation, His universe, in which He directs all things according to His predetermined plan for His glory and for the good of His people. In other words, God is involved in every moment, in every place from the moment of His creation until now and on into the future. He has written it all down, He has determined it, and He is working out His plan. Nothing in this universe is left to chance. It is not random or luck, nor uh, is uh, the things of this universe and the events that happen determined by an impersonal life force. God, our all-powerful Creator and Lord, is actively related to and involved in all of His creation in such a way that He directs all things to fulfill His purposes. And though it may seem that God is only interested and involved in the big things of life and not my little ordinary life, The book of Ruth teaches us that God is also governing the small, daily, simple decisions of every one of our lives. Let's review where we've been so that we can jump into chapter 3 where we are. In chapter 1, we see an Israelite family who has left the promised land to move away to the enemy nation of Moab, as we saw in the psalm, God's wash bin. This is a huge mistake. All of the promises of God, according to the law in Exodus 20 through Deuteronomy 32, could only be found in the land of promise. But this family is a faithless one, proving that by leaving God's land. Well, only hardship then becomes their life. Naomi's husband dies, leaving her a widow. Her sons then marry uh, Moabite women. But after 10 years without bearing any children, her sons then die, leaving all three women childless and widows. And it is here that Naomi turns back to Yahweh, the God of Israel. She repents and resolves by faith to get back to the land of promise, entrusting herself to God who promises to provide for widows. And here's where we see the gracious, sovereign providence of God at work in saving Naomi. She was faithless when she left Israel, but God brought calamity upon calamity, upon adversity, upon her life to show her the poverty of a faithless life. And when she finally hit the bottom with nowhere else to go, she came an end to herself and she ran back to the God of all grace and mercy. She called upon the name of Yahweh and began her life of faith. This was God's way, providentially, of reaching Naomi, reminding us all that God brings people to saving faith in the way that He chooses, and true faith in God will only happen when we come to an end of ourselves. Well, on the return trip back to Israel, one of Naomi's daughter-in-laws, Orpah, decides to stay in Moab, but her other daughter-in-law, Ruth, decides with the same faith as Naomi to forsake the gods of Moab, to forsake her family and her people, and entrust herself to Yahweh, who is a refuge to all who trust in Him, especially foreigners. So they return together. There is a, a feeling of probably fear and angst at this point. Here we have two widowed women, no husbands, no children, new faith. How in the world is this going to work out for them? They are vulnerable. They have no protection. They do not have provision. 
How are they going to be provided for? Who is going to look after them? And again, we can't look at this story through the lens of our 21st century American eyes, where women can find a job and provide for themselves fairly well in this culture. These are ancient times in which the men are the breadwinners and the protectors of their estate and their families. Without a man, without a husband, these women will live in poverty and probably be taken advantage of. That's, that's the reality of this point in history. And what's harder is that when Naomi returns, we see this difficulty taking its toll on her at the end of chapter 1. Her neighbors greet her, but she plays the victim card, desiring to be known as a woman of bitterness. And indeed, it's it's a painful situation. And yet, by the time you come to the end of chapter 1, you have a little bit of hope because the barley harvest has begun, and there is a man on the horizon who potentially could care for them. Chapter 2, then, Ruth uh, the Moabitess gets up and the next morning and tells Naomi that she is headed out of town into uh, the fields to work. Now, Ruth uh, apparently knows God's law pretty well from Deuteronomy 24 because God makes the provision for widows and foreigners, which she is both, for farmers to not trim the edges of their field so that the poor and needy like Ruth and Naomi could glean and get grain for food. The field that she picks from just so happens to be owned by a man by by the name of Boaz. Uh, And this is God's providence because Boaz is a godly man and he is a generous man and he is one whom God is going to use to provide for these widowed women. After Boaz inquires about Ruth from his chief farmer and learns of her faith and service Naomi, Boaz approaches Ruth to offer her essentially a full-time job for the season. In other words, Boaz offers her provision and protection for these women. And so by the end of chapter 2, we have something vastly different than the end of chapter 1. At the end of chapter 1, we had some mixed feelings. You know, yay, they're back in the land, but how is this going to work out? And here at the end of chapter 2, we have, wow, God is so gracious and kind to provide for these desperate women who have trusted in Him. And that brings us then into chapter 3. And here we're going to see God's continued sovereign care in the lives of these women. Except in this case... God's care and His providence is going to come in a very strange, uh, risky, tension-filled, potentially reckless situation. Yet what we're going to also see is that these characters are putting on their active faith sneakers, once again, entrusting themselves to God and His providential plan. Let me pray, and then we will look at it together. Open our eyes, O God, that we may behold wonderful things from your word. Open our ears that we may hear and understand. Open our hearts that we may believe and obey all for your glory. Amen. This chapter has a really uh, helpful flow to us because each person, Naomi, Ruth, then Boaz, gets their own spotlight. And on each one of them, the spotlight highlights their faith. Let me show you. First, we begin at the beginning of chapter 3 with Naomi's active faith, which is seen in her love. You'll remember the last time we saw Naomi was at the beginning of the barley harvest at the end of chapter 1. She had repented, she had returned from the promised land, but she was struggling with this new faith. She had returned without a husband to the place and town where they were married and probably to the, to the memories there that he no longer is, he's no longer there with her. Also, her boys are dead. They were probably born in this same house they returned to. And so you have this memory, these memories are flooding her 
And it's very heart-wrenching. And you can understand then sort of the bitterness that she has uh, in returning. And in her weak faith, she believes God will never fill her again, that God is out to get her. Chapter 1, verse 21, the Almighty has afflicted me. But praise the Lord that He is gracious and patient and long-suffering in our weaknesses. Or as Old Testament writers affirm again and again, you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. He shows this to Naomi throughout the entirety of the barley harvest, which is approximately three months long. We hear not a word from Naomi uh, or see any action while Ruth and Boaz get the spotlight in chapter 2 and are shown as godly people. We can only assume that she continues to struggle through this time uh, with this new life God has given her, but still struggling with all this pain that she has returned to. And yet I believe, because God is long-suffering, that throughout this harvest time, God is chipping away at her weak faith at her belief that God is against her. And he's doing this by his providential care. Again, that's the very center of her story. Her providence, or his providence, is what brought her to faith. His providence is what brought her back to Israel at this time. His providence is what brought her to Ruth. His providence is what brought Ruth and Boaz together so that she could have a full-time job and provide for them. All of this providential care by God has been slowly, I think, turning her heart to believe that God is not against her, but truly loves her by doing what He promised, to care for the needy, to hear the prayers and cries of the afflicted and the poor and the widow and the alien, and to comfort them. And so by the end of the barley harvest, Naomi can't help but drop this bitterness, and give way to active faith that results in love. Look at it with me in your Bibles, starting in chapter 2, verse 23. So she stayed close, to, uh, we're talking about Ruth, to buy the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, my daughter, Shall I not seek security for you that it may go well with you? Now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking." It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies. You shall go and uncover his feet and lie down, and then he will tell you what you shall do. True faith in in the Old Testament and the New Testament are built upon the two greatest commands. You know this. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is, trust Him, follow Him, seek Him with the, uh, seek His glory above your own. Love what He loves, hate what He hates. Uh, live your life for Him. Grieve over sin, obey Him. That's what all that means. And the second is like it and equal to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Genuine love for God is seen dominantly in loving your neighbor as you already love yourself. This comes out of Deuteronomy 6, Leviticus 19. These are part of the law of God. And this love here refers to an act of the mind, a will, a determined care of welfare for someone else. It is a dedicated response from the love of God to seek the good of another, maybe even better for them. There is some level of emotion to it, but really... It's regardless of emotion, how you feel. It's the love that God showed all of us, ultimately in the death and resurrection of Christ. And it is the love that all true believers show because they've received this from Christ. And these are totally inseparable. To love God, you must show love to others, specifically God's people. 
And if you show love to others, then you love God. But if you do not show love to others, you do not know God. That's, that's, they're inseparable, as I said. That's exactly what John 1, 4 says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves God is born of God and knows God. And the one who does not love others does not know God, because God is love. And if that wasn't clear enough, Romans 13, 8, Paul says, For he who loves his neighbor fulfills the law. So true love for God, a true follower of God, knows the love of God toward themselves, and then is prompted toward love to others. Naomi is not feeling very loved at the beginning of the barley harvest. But God's loving provision for her through Ruth throughout the barley harvest, has peeled away that dead skin, and she now understands the love of God toward her, then resulting in the other one, which is love for her neighbor. In this case, Ruth. How does she love Ruth? By seeking for Ruth what is rightfully Naomi's. What is rightfully Naomi's that she's giving to Ruth? A kinsman redeemer. Wait, what? A kinsman redeemer. What is that, pastor? What is a kinsman redeemer? I'm glad you asked. Thank you for asking. We need some Old Testament understanding. All right, hang with me here because this is critical to everything that's going on. A kinsman redeemer is God's way of doing two things. Number one, to keep his promise of the physical land of Israel intact And secondly, to provide for and to protect widows. Let's look at both. First, remember that the physical land of Israel was promised to Abraham's descendants, the Jewish people. The land was conquered by the Israelites in Joshua's day and then divided between the families of Israel. Each family was to work and to keep their part of the land, and that piece of land was to stay within the family for successive ongoing every generation. Now, what should happen if distress comes up or failure to grow happens or tragedy or the death of the man of the house? Well, God made a provision for that, that the next closest male family member was obliged, was obligated to help. Literally, he was obligated to redeem that family from their tragedy. So if the family had a debt they could not pay and they had to be sold into slavery, the kinsman redeemer, the next closest male family member, would pay that debt and get their family out of slavery. If the family had to sell their land to somebody for whatever reason, the family redeemer would be responsible to get it back. If someone was murdered in the family, the kinsman redeemer would seek justice for that family. So you can kind of see the idea. God knew families would come on hard times. And in the Old Testament, with the nation of Israel, it was up to the families of the family to get each other out of the jam they were in, especially as it related to the land of that family. So the kinsman redeemer was the helper to the family and to help keep the land inside the family. The other aspect has to do with providing and protecting for widows. And the way this is done is spelled out in Deuteronomy 25. You can just note that down. I'm just going to tell you what it is. If for some reason the man of the house dies and the man has no living sons, then the kinsman redeemer was then obligated to marry that now widowed woman and, quote, perform the duty of a husband's brother to her, which just simply means take care of his land, raise the daughters if they have any, and seek to provide a male child for that widowed woman. Did you get all that? Okay, I'll make it easy, which is always the best practice. A kinsman redeemer is the one who rescues the family from losing God's given land with money and or through marriage. That's what he was for. God provided in that way. In our story, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, dies. 
Her eldest son should have then inherited her father's land. They weren't living in Bethlehem at the time. But then he died, and so did his brother. Now Naomi has land and a name, but no heir. So Naomi needs one of her kinsmen, her closest relative, her kinsman redeemer, to redeem her, to work the land, to provide for a a son for her. That's God's law, very simply. And it was her right as a full-blooded Israelite under the Mosaic law. And so Naomi, upon finding out that Boaz is a close relative, she could have demanded that Ruth go to Boaz and come back to Naomi and redeem Naomi, to marry Naomi, and to bear a son for Naomi in her womb. Ruth then would have just become more or less collateral damage to Boaz and Naomi, a a foreigner who literally owns nothing and is entitled nothing according to the law. All that to say, do you see how incredibly loving Naomi is being right here? Naomi needs to be redeemed, not Ruth. Naomi could have left Ruth in the wind and just sort of kept her maybe on as a servant. But in love, Naomi decides to bring Ruth, listen, into her own redemption, which they will only find in Boaz. So, essentially, Boaz would marry Ruth, bear a son, and that son would be Naomi's heir, uh, essentially Naomi's son. And then Naomi would have been redeemed, and Ruth would have a husband to provide and protect her throughout life. And in having these, Naomi now provides security to Ruth. In fact, that's exactly what we saw. You could see it there in verse 1. My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may go well with you? Security, in Hebrew, manuach, being, it means to be in a settled place, to be in a place of calm, to be in a place where you can lie down without worry or care. Manuach is... is used in Psalm 23 too, to speak of God, our good shepherd, leading his people to waters that are still or quiet, a place of rest and security where you're provided for and cared for and protected. That's why here in Ruth 1, the, the translator of the NAS uh, translated as security. Naomi desired Ruth to not have to continually look over her shoulder every day going to work or, or wonder if this same provision from Boaz, this last barley harvest, was going to continue to the next barley season or if she could sustain this life pattern she has of being a widow who also has to provide for her widowed mother-in-law. Naomi desires to have a permanent care and protection for Ruth. And that permanent security will come in Ruth getting redeemed alongside Naomi. So Naomi wants them both to be redeemed from their former lives, not just herself. That, my friends, is love. That is looking out for the welfare and the good of others. That is making a conscious decision to care for someone else regardless of how you feel. It's it's great love. Such grace upon Ruth from Naomi. And that is an act of faith because it's right according to The Word of God. Deuteronomy 10. God shows His love for the alien by giving him food and clothes. We see that. So show your love for the alien, for you were aliens in the land 
of Egypt. You see? She was shown love by God. And God has shown love to Ruth, the alien, by giving her food and clothing. Now, she is to reciprocate that same love from God to Ruth. And this is how Ruth, uh, Naomi is going to do it. Jerry Bridges once wrote in his great book, Transforming Grace, our love to others can only be a response to God's love for us. And he's right. Naomi had spent months experiencing God's love and his amazing provision for her. And it got a hold of her to the point that she had to respond in loving her closest neighbor, Ruth. And this was the kind of love that we need for each other. We should cherish each other in the same way we cherish our own lives. We should be unselfish and not irritated with each other and and not indifferent. We need to take genuine interest in each other's welfare and well-being. We need to be ready to forgive and not resent wrongs done to us. And, and I know all of you here, here at our church, you are, you're already like this. You're sweet and caring and kind to one another. You're loving people. And all I can do is say what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, excel still more. Continue to extend your love to more of those in this church family whom you don't know. May your love be a shining light of the gospel because, well, we love because he first loved us. Now, with love established toward Ruth, Naomi lays out the plan. And and it really is a simple plan. Naomi tells Ruth that she needs to gussy herself up, you know, not look and smell like she's been working in a field all day. Take a bath, brush up, throw some makeup on, put some nice clothing on, and go to their kinsman Boaz, a godly man, bound to the Word of God and to loving God with his whole being, and he will know the right thing to do. And that then takes us then to, secondly, Ruth's active faith, which we see is humility. Naomi's faith looked like love. Ruth's here is humility. Ruth no doubt loves her mother-in-law and is committed to her. We know that. But I think Ruth's faith is most brightly seen in her humility. We've seen this humility in leaving her homeland, committing herself to the care of her mother-in-law. We've seen this humility in that she has been working long, hard hours for three months in the fields to provide for both of them. We've seen Ruth's humility in her thankfulness to Boaz for his care for them. And now, once more, Ruth's humility shines brightly as she agrees to be the middleman between Boaz and Ruth, uh, Boaz and Naomi. I mean, seriously, she could, she could have said, seriously, Mom, I, I love you, but I am not obligated to such a task. I'm, I'm hap, happy to be unmarried. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't even know if a marriage between an Israelite and a Moabite would be fair or a good idea. It, it could cause all kinds of gossip in the town. Plus, it's a really risky plan what you're coming up with here, going at night to a guy by, by her, myself. So how about, I, how about you just go talk to him yourself? She could have very well done that, and there wouldn't have been anything wrong with it. But look at verse 5. She said to her, all that you say, I will do. Wait, what? Where's the pushback? Where's the conversation? Where's the, can we come up with a better plan maybe? How about discuss some other options? No, none of that. Zip. She just said, I'm all right, and she was off. It's amazing. What a perfect execution of the text we know so well in Philippians 2. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. That is Ruth. 
As a model of faith, she didn't care about her own agenda or her own personal interests. Something that Boaz actually made mention, will make mention of her in verse 10 here in chapter 3, when he commends her for not going after young men, whether poor or rich. In other words, again, Ruth could have refused Naomi's request, said, Mom, I love you but I'm still young and I want to live my life. Maybe you need to find someone else to do this or just do it yourself. But Ruth didn't do that. Ruth sees Naomi's need and she regards Naomi's need as more important than her own wants and desires. It's really precious what we see here in that one little phrase. All you say I will do. It's crazy because this is like the opposite of our culture. It tells you to pursue your own dreams. Don't let everyone hold you down. Look out for number one. Keep climbing higher. That's the world's mindset. In fact, even in the 5th century BC, Plato, the Greek philosopher, said... How can a man be happy when he has to serve someone? And yet God's way, and therefore the best way, is always about preferring others, serving others, loving others, humility. That was Jesus' way. We saw that last week in John chapter 13. He came to serve, not to be served. And even after His ultimate service of dying on the cross, raising again. He went back to heaven, and guess what? He still serves you and me by praying for us at the throne of grace. Serving is God's way. And that's where happiness comes from. Humility is our battle cry. And such is the way of Ruth. So, verse 6 She gets clean and, follow along, she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was happy, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came secretly, uncovered his feet to lay down and lay down. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward. And behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, "Uh, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. I hope you feel the tension of this moment. Don't let the Bible become so familiar that you're not like all in on what the storyteller is doing here. There's a lot of tension in this moment. See, Ruth heads to Boaz's threshing floor at night to meet with Boaz. A a threshing floor, in case you don't know what that is, uh, uh, is a large level circular area on the ground, about 25 to 40 feet or so in diameter, usually up on a hill. Farmers would spread out all the harvested grain on the ground and then bring oxen and donkeys to crush the grain in order to sort of loosen up the edible parts of the grain from the inedible parts of chaff. And when that was done, the, the, the farmers would take pitchforks and throw all the stuff in the air, and the good grain would fall back to the ground, the chaff would blow away in the wind, and then they would push all the good grain into a pile in the corner. And this already happened. And then, of course, a big meal happened. And when Boaz was satisfied with his meal, he decided to call it a night to hit the hay, hit the grain, as it were. For the night of sleep. You know, and, the, and you have to ask, why didn't Boaz just go back to the house? <laughs> because God providentially had him sleeping by the grain pile. And the reason he was sleeping by the grain pile is because the grain was the source of income. And there were still robbers and evil people who would want to steal the grain because, again, that's income. It would be like sitting by a pile of money. So to protect it, one or a few men would sleep next to the grain on the threshing floor. Naomi knew Boaz would be doing that this night, and so Ruth was told to go there 
and to do so at night after dark. And again, this just feels really sketchy and possibly not a good idea in the dark, alone, a single young girl with a single man near where he sleeps. Men have been drinking wine. A lot seems bad could have happened here. Add to this, it was common practice in the ancient Near East that many immoral rituals happened by the threshing floor or on the threshing floor around the harvest time. So there's a lot of tension here, a lot of like, ooh, what's going to happen? I really hope this was a good decision, gulp. But we can take comfort in knowing that Naomi is not stupid. She has seen the faith and integrity of both Ruth and Boaz, and for her, this is the best way to get them together. This is not a recommended way for you to find your spouse. This is, this is descriptive language, not prescriptive. This is, not, this is how you find a spouse, men or women. This is the best decision for this situation, and that is it, even with the tension And I think there's also a brief lesson we can learn here a little bit from Naomi. Faith is sometimes risky. We are are not God and therefore cannot know the future until it is the present. Therefore, we have to make daily decisions, sometimes big life-altering decisions, based upon the information we have available to us right now. And where faith comes in is that we make the decision and entrust that decision into the hands of God and His sovereign plan. I don't know the future. I don't know how God is going to work this all out. But I'm going to do what is best based upon what I know, based upon counsel, based upon prayer. And I'm not going to sin or practice foolishness, but I am going to make a decision, and I'm going to entrust it to God to work it out by His grace. I hope some of this sounds familiar to, especially some of you older saints. You've done this a hundred billion times, right? It's risky, but it's the right kind of faith. It's a, it's a faith that does as Proverbs 3, 6 says, in all your ways, in all of your walkings, acknowledge Him and He will keep your path straight. God is not going to tell you what to do in every moment of your life. He's not going to open the clouds and give you direction in every single circumstance. Uh, unless it's to sin, then He'll always uh, move you to get away from that. God expects you to make decisions in life based upon His Word, based upon wisdom, and in doing so, admitting you're making the best decision possible in trusting Him with whatever the outcome may be. That's a risky faith. I would actually call that a mature faith. And that is what both Ruth and Naomi are doing in this situation. They know God's word about a kinsman redeemer. Boaz is one of those. So now they need to get him to agree to redeem them. And so this is the path they chose, as risky as it may seem. And then they will wait to see how God will work out his sovereign purpose. So Ruth heads off. And her execution is perfect, sort of. Remember in verse 4, Ruth was just to uncover his feet. By the way, this is just simply that. It's just uncovering his feet to get his feet cold so that he would wake up. And, and uh, that's it. There's nothing else to this. And it worked. He woke up. And then all Ruth was instructed to do was just let, Ruth, or let Boaz do the talking. Ruth didn't do that. Ruth strayed from the plan just a little bit. Instead of waiting for Boaz to come out of the fog of sleep and figure out exactly what's going on, she just comes out and says it the moment he wakes up. Spread your covering over your maid. You're my close relative. Imagine it. (laughs) Your spouse wakes you up from a dead sleep with big news. And it's kind of tough to... Wait, what? But Ruth does it anyway. 
Spread your covering over your maid. You are a close relative. Literally, and I love this in Hebrew, spread your wing over your maid, for you are a redeemer. You're obligated by God to marry me. What a proposal. (laughs) Not sure it's a great pickup line, but it worked. I should have tried that with uh, Michelle. No. Don't try that. It's not. But notice what Ruth is saying. Spread your wing. The picture is of a bird covering her chicks from a storm. Ruth is seeking refuge from Boaz. Ruth has already done this with God. Remember, you just look up the page there, maybe back a page. But in chapter 2, verse 12, Boaz tells Ruth that he knows she has already, that by leaving her family and her home and her past life and coming to the God of Israel, she has sought under his wings for refuge. Ruth came to saving faith already. She was already under the refuge spiritually of God of Israel, His protection, His provision, His grace. But now she is seeking a very specific refuge from God, one that Boaz can fulfill in being her husband to provide and to protect her and Naomi. And this would be clear to the average Hebrew reader because spreading your wings over somebody was a common idiom for uh, marriage. And this is clear to Boaz right away, as we'll see in just a moment. But the point here is we have, women, we have a woman of faith who knows God's grace upon her life who has pardoned all of her iniquities, who has redeemed her life from the pit, who crowns her with loving kindness and compassion. And she knows God's word in providing for her needs, especially in the promise of a kinsman redeemer. And she has a humble heart because of it, seen most most clearly in her serving Naomi. Ruth has no personal agenda on her mind but desires that her mother-in-law be redeemed. And so she humbly and gratefully seeks God's will for Naomi. Faith is humble. That then moves us on to Boaz. Thirdly, Boaz's active faith is wisdom. You know very well that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear can mean several things. It can mean terror, of something or someone. It can mean respect in the way that a child fears their father or a servant their master. And it can also mean reverence or awe of somebody who is greater. I think the fear of the Lord encompasses all three of these things. To put it maybe simply, one commentator wrote that the fear of the Lord involves turning around in humbled conviction of our sins, taking the Word of God to heart, and submitting ourselves to Him as Lord and Savior. The fear of the Lord requires that we hear and understand the Word of God, and that we see the relevance and truth of its revelation of Him and His will, and that we rest our weight upon it in such a way that a changed life is a result. In other words, fear is faith. Fear is faith. Faith is the beginning of wisdom. Faith, trust in God and His Word, causes us to live by it and according to it, which is a wise life. And that's exactly what we see in Boaz, a a life of faithful fear, uh, fearful faith in which God's Word is the backbone of everything Boaz does. So Boaz's active faith is a life of wisdom, a life of living by God's word. How do we see that here in this moment in the dark, just having woke up with a well-dressed, good-smelling young lady asking to marry him and redeem him, her, and Naomi? Look at it, verse 10. Then he said... May you be blessed of Yahweh, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. 
Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. For a dude that just woke up, this is an incredible response. Can you respond this way when you wake up? I can't. (laughs) Other men might have taken advantage of this situation, but not strong faith Boaz. He has committed his life to honoring God and serving others in purity and selflessness. So there is nothing here that is inappropriate. Ruth is acting in faith. Boaz, even in the fogginess of his mind, recognizes it and responds in faith as well. First, he commends her for her faith that she has not only been kind to care for Naomi in working in the fields, but now showing kindness by willing to put aside her own desire to possibly marry a younger man and instead be the redeemer for Naomi and her family. And she is blessed by God because of this. She has pleased God. And by the way, we just, we just all need to be better at this, I think, commending other people for their faith. I think most of the time we're pretty good at seeing other people's faith and in our hearts uh, affirming that that's a great thing, but I think rarely do we ever actually go up to people and tell them, I saw your act of faith and God is pleased by that and it encourages me. And I think we need to be better at this. The second comment that Boaz makes is that he will indeed seek their redemption. And, and, and he doesn't think it's going to be much of a problem at all because Boaz's people, the farmers and the servants, will back Boaz that Ruth, though a Moabite, is a woman worth marrying. She is a woman of excellence, which makes, should make your head just go like, oh, Proverbs 31, which again, Ruth was placed right behind Proverbs in the Hebrew Old Testament, probably for that reason. So here we have Boaz's faith coming alive. Uh, Though again, still probably a bit groggy from waking up. Uh, Boaz will seek these women to be redeemed. He will follow God's law. But note well that this will come at a cost to him, which true faith, true love always comes at a cost. What cost? Well, Boaz is not the closest relative. Look at verse 12. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a closer relative than I. Man. I love storytelling. This is awesome. (laughs) You just kind of feel it. Man, no way. I I thought Boaz was supposed to redeem him. I thought this whole thing was headed toward this cutesy little romance between Boaz and Ruth. There's supposed to be wedding bells at the end of this. No. This is what makes this story so good. It's such a good storytelling. Sort of keeps us on the edge of our seats. Boaz is willing to redeem them, but his life is held captive to the word of God. And Boaz already knows there's a closer relative, which means the dude already looked into it. It is that man's job to redeem Naomi and Ruth. So Boaz, though wanting, desiring to redeem them, won't. It feels like sort of a letdown. Until, verse 13, remain this night and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good. Let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, Then I will redeem you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Aha! A glimmer of hope. So if the man shirks on his responsibility toward God in redeeming Ruth and Naomi, then Boaz will be happy to obey. Oh, this is such good faith. Good faith. Faith upon faith in this man. A promise to redeem. A vow to obey God's word. No wonder Boaz recognizes Ruth as a woman of excellence. He himself is one, which, by the way, is a key for you single folks out there um, of getting a godly spouse. You be godly. 
And in your pursuit of godliness, in his way, you will attract the same, and you will recognize the same in others. Now, how do we get Ruth home? It's late at night. Who knows what kind of evils are waiting between the field and the city and what stuff's going on in the city. So Boaz has a solution for that. Verse 14, so she lay at his feet until morning and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. Again, he said, let me, uh, give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. And she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. So she went up to the city. See, Boaz knew he couldn't let her leave. But it looks really immoral for them to stay together. So we have a problem. But wisdom says, keep her here to protect her. So she stays near to him, but stays at his feet until morning. That's wisdom. And when morning comes, then they need to bug out early so that nobody sees that she was there. Again, this was to probably try to avoid any gossip or talk about immorality. I also think this was probably to avoid any news about Boaz's interest in Ruth getting to that other closer relative because had he found out, he might have exploited the situation. And the only reason I say that, I'll show you next week, but this closer relative is not exactly a model of faith. So they get up in the morning and then Boaz measured out six measures, probably approximately 60 to 90 pounds. That's heavy. Um, uh, puts the grain to her shawl, helps her get up on her strong back, and then sends her home. Again, just another act of just smartness on, on his case. It would protect her from any gossip of why she's wandering around so early in the morning by herself. And, but because she has grain, it would look like she's just picking up some grain or did some early work in the morning. It's just brilliant. It's genius. No suspicion would come on her at all. But I also believe that he wasn't just doing this for wisdom's sake, but it was also a pledge for Ruth to take back to Naomi that Boaz has promised to redeem them. And this, this grain, is a down payment to keep his promise. I know I've said it before, but I love Boaz. His name means strength. And it is quite obvious that his strength is not one of personal might, but of his faith. Boaz has a strong faith in Yahweh and is committed to God's way in every situation, even odd situations like this one. And that takes us to the final bit of this chapter, uh, back to Naomi, where we see Ruth and Naomi's faith together, which is rest. You'll remember, and you can look at it if you want to turn a page back, in Ruth 1.9, Naomi was leaving Moab, and she said to her daughters-in-law, may the Lord grant that you find rest, each in the house of her husband. Naomi desired her daughters to, daughters-in-law to find security and permanence and stability, and that would come with having a husband. And that desire has not waned in Naomi. And now as Ruth returns, her faith leads her to go from this go, 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 active, sort of risky uh, faith to them waiting and trusting and resting in a what is God going to do next kind of faith. Look at it, verse 16 through 18 of chapter 3. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. She said, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. There's great comfort and encouragement in, in our shared faith. We know that. Our faith in the Lord is what binds us. Our confidence in God and His promises is what we all love. And there is a great comfort when we can mutually encourage one another to rest in His 
great promises. That's why the Apostle Paul shares so many personal anecdotes at the beginning of all his letters, because we have all shared, we have all shared faith, and God has given each of us that faith to lift each other up when we're down, to strengthen each other when we're weak, to remind each other of God's work when we forget or are struggling. That's the ministry of the saints. If you don't know what else to do with each other, this is what you do. Remind each other of God's great promises. And the encouragement here is to wait and to rest. What is the meaning of this? Well, knowing a little Hebrew sort of helps. Wait, my daughter, in verse 18. You can see it there at the beginning. Wait, my daughter, literally is sit down, my daughter. There's nothing else you need to do. You've done everything you're supposed to do. And now we sit and we wait to see what God is going to do. And this is really helpful and wise. Yes, we need to actively do what God has clearly called us to do. We need to live by his word and in his wisdom. But many times we must sit and wait. Stop going and doing and forcing God to answer. Rather, do God's word, what, what, what God's word calls you to, and then wait for God's perfect plan to unfold. Trust him. Like a farmer who waits the product of his faithful sowing, so we need to await the harvest of our faith efforts. Be faithful in each task, and then wait for God to bless your faithful deeds in the way he sees fit. And no, this pleases God. It pleases God for you to have an active waiting. Psalm 147, 11, the Lord favors those who fear him, those who wait on his loving kindness. The other phrase in Hebrew that makes clear this second is the second half of this verse 18. You can see it there. Uh, Wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. Literally, sit down until when you will know how the matter falls. Here we have a reference to the ancient practice of casting lots. Lots were made out of uh, pieces of wood and, or stone. Uh, these pieces would be shaken together or thrown down or chosen at random out of a bowl, sort of like either tossing dice or flipping a coin or drawing out of a hat. And, and though that sounds like gambling, this actually was a sanctioned practice by God for Israel under the old covenant only to determine his will in any given situation. And it was apparently a fairly common practice, even to the point that Solomon wrote a proverb about it in Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. And so what Naomi is encouraging Ruth is, let's wait and see how the lot falls. Let's see what God does. After all, every decision is from the Lord. The point here is that these women are actively placing their unknown futures in the hand of God. They have rest in their souls in God's coming plan. What will it be? Only God knows that at this point. They don't. What's going to happen? How will it happen? All of it is completely out of their hands and control. All these women can do is actively practice the faith of rest in God's providence, His great plan, which has been nothing but gracious and perfect and good and for their welfare up to this point. And so they can wait and they can trust in the perfect, providential, sovereign hand of God. Thankfully, the story doesn't end here. It'll wrap up in less than 24 hours of this time here. After all, verse 18, the man will not rest. (laughs) He will not rest until it's done. He knows what he needs to do, and he will take care of 
these women by God's direction and God's word. The waiting will be hard, but the answer will come, and they will see their redemption that day. For now, they have to wait and rest to find out what God's decided for them. What will it be? Well, you'll have to come back next week. Hebrews 12, 1 reminds us that we have a great cloud of saints that have gone before us, lived lives of faith, and the encouragement from their lives, the application from looking at their lives like these three is that we would do the same, that we would lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us, and that we would run with endurance as they did the race that is set before us. Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz have modeled that so faithfully to us. We need to see their example and persevere by the same faith, by loving others, by being humble toward others, and living a life of wisdom that is founded upon and rests in God's word and in his sovereign care for us. Let me pray. Thank you, O oh God, for this amazing book again. So simple. Such a small story. Such ordinary people. But what an incredible display of faith in these dear saints. Their faith was real and, and genuine and practical. And we need to see that. And we are thankful that you have recorded it for us in your words so that we too can run our race of faith with endurance like they did, even with our own unique challenges in our own lives. Forgive us for when we, fall, we fail to have an active faith. Show us your grace when we do fail to rest in your sovereign purpose for us. Show us when we need to have a faith that goes beyond, that goes and, and does, and show us when we need to have a faith that waits and rests. Help us to be an encouragement to others in that faith. We know that you will lead us, that you are sovereign, that your plan is perfect for us, that even when it looks like we've messed up, your, your grace and mercy are right there to meet us. Strengthen us, O oh God, to walk by faith for your glory. In Christ's name.